Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to begin in verse 11 as we continue through this study throughout the book of Hebrews. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. This is God's inerrant word. Thanks be to God. So we continue on our tour of the Hall of Faith of Hall of Fame of Faith, as we say, and today we step into the room that houses memories and has names such as Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac, and there's a lot that can be said, much more than I would be able to cover today, but uh, I know Pastor Mike covered much uh, last week, and then next week, uh, John Green's going to be bringing the word. He's going to begin in verse 13, continue on in this hall as we make this journey through here, but I want to highlight just a few uh, things in this portion for us this morning. There are uh, reminders here of a historic biography of faith that continues with one of the most important people in Jewish history, in Christian history, and in fact, other religions throughout the world have claimed this man as well. His name is Abraham. But from our perspective, as we look at this this morning from God's Word, we are reminded that this man of faith was an old man of faith, as he and his wife, Sarah, they were both up in years. To quote the great theologian, B. Taylor, from the Andy Griffith Show, we're not spring chickens anymore. So, that's who they were. It's a powerful reminder, God uses faithful men and women. He uses uh, young people and older people. He uses natives of a land and foreigners within the land. He uses rich people and poor people and every other categorization you could come up with for his glory. And we discover in this passage that faith displayed here provides three primary things. First, it's faith that provides power. Faith provides perspective, secondly. And thirdly, faith provides patience. Well, let's look, at, look again at verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive. That's an interesting phrase just to consider that, how that's worded. Even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful, God faithful, who had promised. It's a very tricky passage, especially when you start comparing the English transliterations of the language or the original languages that we have. There are numerous translations that understand Sarah to be the subject here. But you will find some English translations that don't have Sarah as the subject, but Abraham as the subject, even in this passage. So the question is, who is it? Abraham who had the faith, or Sarah who had the faith? Which one deserves to be in the Hall of Fame? Well, certainly Abraham, as expressed in prior verses here, but we also see this moment where Sarah, by name, moves to the front. I believe the translation is correct here. I don't think it's a mistake, though there are linguists that continue to argue and discuss a, an accent mark in the original language there. So uh, they can do that, but, but I like what one, one, one translator said. Now, this is going to be good. You might want to write this down. I don't know if this is on the kids' bulletin, David, so let me know, all right? David's the oldest kid in the room. He, he gets that kids' bulletin, so we're good, all right? Here's the quote. Sarah herself is nominative and not dative. There. I hope that helps. Does that clarify? Okay, me neither. So here we go. It is a true statement. It's about whether she's the subject or is she not the subject of this. But it, it isn't a small controversy. It is a controversy. But let's look at Sarah, the wife of Abraham here. Let's look at how this woman who may be moved into a supporting role by many had to have faith in God as well. She had to have faith in God as well, and her faith uh, was that which the writer of Hebrews emphasizes here from, my, from this understanding, from the translation we're reading, and from what I believe is true. Sarah was praying to have a son. It's clear through the Old Testament. The writer here states it is the power to conceive. She was not praying for conception simply because she really wanted to have a kid. She was praying for this primarily because she wanted to be in line with the promises God had made to her husband Abraham. Not only that promise to Abraham, but she's in the room, she's part of the story, she's the wife of Abraham, therefore the promises to both. That they would be, or Abraham would be the father of descendants to come, many descendants to come. 
Abraham would be the father of a great nation. Thus, Sarah had been chosen to be the mother of a great nation. Evidence through Genesis 15. Abraham's faith was strong, but it did waver. I want to take you back to Genesis 15, just read a short passage for you here in verse 3. Abram, at the time, before the name was extended to Abraham, Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son will be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, the number of the stars, or, and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So in the beginning part, there's wavering. You know, God, I know you promised this, but I don't see it happening, so I'm going to fix it for you. God says, I didn't call you to fix it. I called you to believe. Quit trying to do it on your own. Come step outside, if you would. If God says step outside, that's a frightening thing, right? So step outside. Look up to the sky. Count the stars. I'll give you a moment. Can't do it, can you? Why? Because there's so many. That's how many descendants you will have from your son, your son of promise. Sarah, too, had wavering faith at moments. Uh, It was revealed in her presentation of her handmaiden Hagar to Abraham as her fix for the, obviously, God not showing up in time. So Abraham did have a child with Hagar, but that was not God's promise. Abraham and Sarah, then, we know, both heard the promise of God. They sought to fulfill it in their own power. So they wavered in their faith. Anybody here ever kind of try to do religiously, Jesus-y, Christianese kind of things on your own, thinking it's a good idea? To only be corrected later to say, for God saying, I think you forgot your role. You're, all those people that try, all, of, all those people, like I'm not one. All, all of us who try to do things on our own that are good and godly and right without ex- waiting on the Lord are the people that put God as my co-pilot on the bumper sticker on their car. Those are the people God is saying, when did I get the second seat? God doesn't want to be our co-pilot. So maybe you can relate. Any of us who try to help God with what we wanted or thought he was supposed to be doing. Yet this dear saintly woman, now in her 90s, by the way, would become pregnant. Let that kind of sink in. Yeah, I just wanted to hear the collective groan from all the ladies in the room right then. They went, what? And Abraham is commended, and so is Sarah. It's a great reminder that any conception of life, think of this, the creation of an image bearer of God is more than simply biology, but it also holds deeply theological implications. We were talking about being an image bearer of God with our students every Wednesday evening, and it lays right on this. Maybe this needs to be heard by someone today. There are no accidental children. There are no illegitimate children. There are accidental parents and illegitimate parents, but there are no accidental illegitimate children. The child of promise is the one of whom Sarah is awaiting, that would be Isaac. The child of promise is not the Messiah, he is not the Christ, he is not the perfect son of God. That birth would come thousands of years later, but this birthday, this baby announcement, this gender reveal was all known because it was promised by God. This is the greatest gender reveal before there were ever gender reveals. God said, it's gonna be a boy. I'm not even pregnant, just hang tight, it's gonna be a boy. Get all your blue balloons now. This was a divinely promised birth. Not a virgin birth, but a birth. Old lady Sarah and old man Abraham, collectively not spring chickens, are to have a boy. And thus, when this faithful lady heard what she heard, she did what? Do you remember? When she heard she was going to have a baby, she laughed. Why? Because there's no 90-year-old woman having a baby. That's crazy talk. It was preposterous. It was improbable, if not impossible. Yet even in her disbelief, ultimately her faith in God remained. Faith provided power to believe and to receive. The verse says she received power to conceive. And that is not how we often refer to the conception of a child. 
But it is clear through these words that they mean what they say. The power is revealed in that God chose a 90-year-old woman to be the one to birth the son of a 100-year-old man. Don't translate their ability to have a baby to your ability to have a child, but look to the fact, because people say, well, if I prayed for a child, why doesn't God give me a child? That, that's misappropriating the passage here. Look to the faith that is displayed and how God promised and kept his promise. God did not give Abraham a proverb. He gave him a promise. He covenanted with him. The couple's faith, Abraham and Sarah's, was tested for years. But I love this phrase in the passage of Hebrews 11. Since she considered him, God, faithful who had promised. Sometimes in our lives, we, we hear the word, we go to church, we do the religious stuff, and then we wonder, is God really there remaining faithful to, of the God of promise? Faith provides <clears throat> provides power to believe. Secondly, faith provides perspective. Look at verse 12. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, maybe the, maybe the best phrase I've ever read in Scripture, at least in the last three or four weeks. I, I will get onto that one. One man, him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. From one man, who is that man? Abraham. And how is he described by the writer of Hebrews? As good as dead. Does that hurt anybody's feelings? <laughs> what a statement. The Bible pulls no punches. This is not ageism, by the way. It's not prejudice. This is what we call biblical bluntness. This 100-year-old man was described, quote, unquote, by the Holy Spirit-inspired writer of the book of Hebrews to be as good as dead. Now, he wasn't dead, but he was good as dead to accentuate the miracle that a child would be born from him and from Sarah. So, in a culture <laughs> that, that really gets frustrated, because that, 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 it sounds insulting. <laughs> but here's the reality. For all of us who worship youth, when you're 100 years old, there's no way around this. When you're 100 years old, if you make it to 100 years old, you are actually closer to your funeral than to your birth announcement. <clears throat> it's a reality. Now, some of you are like, well, I don't like to think about that. Welcome to the church of reality, where we speak truth and we don't sugarcoat it. But I'm not trying to be mean about it. The fact of the matter is, at my age, I have had more birthdays in my past than I probably will in my future. It's just a reality. I don't dwell on it, but I'm reminded of it every morning, <laughs> usually about three or four o'clock. So... Abraham is that guy. So in a culture like we live in today that sells youth, youth enhancements, whether it's makeup or surgeries or stylish clothes or escapism or the golden bachelor or anything else, the words of scripture ring true. Abraham, as good as dead, was used by God to populate a nation. A man with up until this point lived with an unanswered promise with no son of the covenant and no child with Sarah in any logical setting would have given up hope. Abraham, who is Abraham? Abraham would be the guy that is the, the star and the one featured in advertisements that air on television during the day. That's that guy. Abraham would be nowadays selling reverse mortgages on TV. He would be advertising hearing aids, life insurance add-ons, Medicare Part C, prepaid funerals, and medications designed to fool our bodies into thinking they're 30. That's Abraham. And some of you are going, I don't know what you mean, but the rest of you go, I know exactly what you mean. Because you watch, I mean, you, you know, you're watching um, Blue Bloods all day. So you get the commercials, right? Between Price is Right and Blue Bloods. I mean, I'm not saying you guys, I guess I should say we guys, all right? It's on that day off. I'm like, wow, you know. Abraham would not be the guy selling Pampers or Similac or featured in Mountain Dew ads. That's not Abraham. This is what the writer's saying here. Sarah had a deep faith. She had perspective on life, and while the world says perception is reality, you ever heard that perception is reality? Every now and then it's wise to get a clue and face the real reality that sometimes is opposite of an individual's perception. 
Since all truth is God's truth, Sarah understood that her husband was as quote unquote good as dead as related to the possibility of him and her conceiving a child. Faith is not fantasy. Faith is not foolish optimism, however. Here's a word. Faith is neither fideism, if you want that one, F-I-D-E-I-S-M, fideism, which means this, faith without reason. Faith also is not rationalism, which means reason without faith. But what does faith also provide? It provides patience. Everybody wants patience. At least that's what we say. I'm just praying God will give me patience. You don't need to be praying that. We all want patience until God provides a scenario when you have to use it. In a culture that's always in a hurry to get to wherever we can be in a hurry next, patience is hard. The saints of old were faithful in their walk and faithfully patient. It is made clear in verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things that were promised. Doesn't mean God doesn't keep his promise. Just means that these saints of old live faithfully, looking forward, but never seeing Jesus face to face and many of the other promises which were fulfilled and will be. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. The ones specifically spoken of, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and many, many others died in faith. They received many promises, but not all things were fulfilled before the as good as dead were dead. Yet they lived looking forward, knowing and trusting that God does not waver. The one who is sovereign in the past and the present, you can trust that he owns the future as well. It's, an, it's a comforting feeling to know that when you turn on the news and terrible things are happening and they shock you and they surprise you and oh my goodness, what's going on, that God is never going, oh, I never saw that coming. That's what sovereignty means. So just because we may not see tomorrow, we can trust the one who owns the clock and the calendar and is not constrained by that which he created. Therefore, the God who is remains the God who always has been and the God who always will be. Maybe that's not very comforting you right now because you, maybe like me, want everything answered immediately. Many of us want our answers before we can even articulate the questions. But to be men and women of faith means we have to trust our faith gives us power to see ourselves and to let God see us through the day. To have the kind of faith that we are challenged to have gives us a perspective on a story where we're not the main character in it anymore. If you're the main character of your story, then you're reading a really bad story. And faith also provides patience. We can trust the one who has promised.